You're listening to the Dear Baseball Gods podcast. I'm Dan Blewett, and on this show, you'll learn advanced concepts in baseball explained simply. I'm here to guide you on your baseball journey and help you paddle through what's now an ocean of misinformation, guruism, and overly technical diamond babble. Hey, welcome back. This is the Dear Baseball Gods podcast. I'm Dan Blewett, and on today's episode, we've got three great topics. Number one, four pitchers, does a higher leg kick mean higher velocity? Number two, when we're talking about 2-2 and 3-2 counts, there's a common wisdom that says what you throw 2-2 is what you should also throw 3-2. So we're going to discuss why that is, in fact, valid. And number three, when should you remove yourself from a game due to injury? So I wrote an article about playing through pain and the difference between being hurt and being injured, which is a common sentiment. We'll talk a little bit about when you should alert your coach as to when you're going to be essentially hurting the team. Okay, so first topic, leg kicks. So Nolan Ryan is famous for saying that if he could lift his leg higher, he would have thrown harder. And of course, that's just his own anecdote and him sort of knowing his own body. But he also had a a super high leg kick. So if you are a younger person and uh, don't know what Nolan Ryan's mechanics look like, he had a really high leg kick and he was, I'd say, reasonably explosive um, with that leg kick in general. So he wasn't one of these very slow, deliberate, he was, I'd say, a little bit farther on the faster side of his delivery once his leg kick went up and down, and then it was kind of go time. So from my experience, uh, you know, as a pitching instructor and as a baseball academy owner, when we would do our velocity programs where we'd be slowly ramping kids up for the season and then have a longer, you know, maybe like six to 10 week phase where we're throwing harder into nets and doing some different types of mechanical drills, stuff like that, trying to help kids get their arms into full speed shape and also help them develop some increased velocity. And we'd be thrown into radar guns a little bit. When we would do that, what we would commonly see when kids were trying to break a previous record on a radar gun. So they're thrown from the stretch or thrown from the windup and they hit 79, they're trying to hit 80. What they would typically do, we would see their leg kicks go higher and we would see their leg kicks move faster. Um, and of course, this can be a bit of a red herring. You you don't really make your money as far as velocity in the early parts of your delivery, which is why you can see uh, pitchers in the big leagues, like a lot of the, the Asian players who are very slow, sometimes have big pauses. They're very slow and deliberate in the early parts of their delivery because ultimately it doesn't matter that much until they start to stride down the mound. When they start to stride down the mound, that's when they're putting ground forces, um, well, into the ground. They're putting force into the ground. That's when the whole sort of kinetic chain starts to really matter, right? The force you put into the ground matters. And as you start to stride yourself down the mound, that's when all of your body parts have to really be in sync. And then as soon as your front foot, your stride foot touches down, that's when things matter the absolute most. This is the landing position. That's the key spot where just like as a hitter, if you, you know, take your little stride, whether you have a leg kick or you you don't, if you're lunging your weight forward before that foot hits, or if you're picking that foot up and your hips are rotating before that foot comes back down, what's going to happen? You're going to be either sort of flying open your barrels in and out of the zone, or you're on your front foot and you have that sort of butt out swing and you're not going to have any power left. And it's the same exact thing with pitchers. So the biggest thing as a pitcher is what happens, what position you're in when your your stride foot touches the ground, right? That's the biggest checkpoint in the delivery. So that being said, um, the stuff that comes before it, especially the stuff that comes before you actually start striding down the mound, definitely is important, but a lot less so as far as like tempo and speed and stuff like that. So the big things with leg kick, I don't really have an answer as to whether leg kicks increase velocity i think if you look as a, like a, a more of like a meta analysis if you're looking at is there a correlation between velocity and leg kick height there's definitely not so if you you know you go in the major leagues it's not like the hardest throwing players all have higher leg kicks and slower throwing players all have lower leg kicks that's definitely not true um you know the, the correlations between really high throwing or hard throwing players in general and lower throwing players they're mechanical they're also how well they they move their body their flexibility their mobility their body control there's lots of factors right muscle fiber type is another 
Um, and so as far as leg kick height goes, does it add velocity? Well, by itself, it's just lifting your leg up and back down, right? So you can, especially for pro pitchers, they typically throw the same speed out of the stretch and the same speed throwing from a slide step as they do from their windup. Or if they throw slower, it's maybe one miles per hour. And the reason there might be a difference is because it's simply easier to keep your weight back and sort of like go down the mound at your best pace when you have a leg kick you've just a little more time it's easier for you to hip to lead forward it's easier to keep your weight back over the rubber a little bit longer so you don't have that front foot kind of landing again i think a good analogy is kind of like a hitter so really what i think the mechanism that a leg kick gives you is more so helping you stay in proper timing and this is something we see a lot with youth pitchers where they really struggle going to the stretch because now they don't have the hip strength they don't know how to control their body as well they don't lead with their hip as well they don't keep their weight back over the rubber longer and so now when they go the stretch you know which doesn't really have a leg kick so much now they're throwing slower they're walking guys whatever it's not really because of the leg kick it's because they don't know how to get the things that maybe the leg kick gives them which is sort of more time in the air to figure their body out and keep their weight back and get their hip going so the leg kick in itself, I don't think we could really say it causes higher velocity, but I do think it gives pitchers a little bit of a better chance, especially when they're younger, to put themselves in a good position to reach their best velocity. So I wouldn't conflate that with saying this causes more velocity because, again, at, at high levels in college and pro ball, it's just not. It's just definitely not true that higher leg kick pitchers throw harder than lower leg kick pitchers. And it's also not really true that pitchers throw harder from the windup than the stretch. There's really not much of a difference at all, especially when you consider the difference in one mile per hour between 90 and 89 is 1%, right? It's a very small difference. Obviously, it's a meaningful difference sometimes to pitchers, but in the way we really start to think about performance, one mile per hour is like 1%. That's very, very small um, impact for any different you know, part of the body or, or piece of your mechanics. Now, if something is said, oh, I do this and I throw seven miles per hour harder, that's a really significant difference, obviously. So no, leg kicks don't really help you throw harder, but I think especially for younger pitchers, the pronounced uh, benefit of having a leg kick is just helping them keep on time, keep their weight back longer, use their hips better. It's easier to do a lot of those things than from the stretch. All right, let's do our 90 second mindset. So today we're going to talk about why what you throw 2-2 as a pitcher is essentially the same and correct pitch call for 3-2. So I put out a poll asking what people thought that I gave a hypothetical situation. This is also a YouTube video where I give a detailed explanation. So feel free to look for that on my YouTube channel where what the question was, what should you throw 3-2 given a bunch of different multiple choices? One was a slider, one was a changeup, one was a fastball. I gave different percentages for the different options. And um, in asking that question in general, a lot of people said, hey, you know, what you throw 2-2 is what you should throw 3-2. And that was also something that was told to me a long time ago when I was in my early 20s. And I thought a lot about that statement. And I wondered, is this really true? Um, and I came to believe that it is. And this was something that I pass on to my players as a coach. And here's why I think what you throw 2-2 is what you should throw 3-2. I mean, the difference between the two counts, the only major difference is that 3-2, if you throw a ball, you walk the guy. But both counts are obviously two strikes. They're both where a hitter's seen a lot of pitches in the bat. So it's a minimum of four and then a minimum of five, obviously. Good math, Dan. And then they're both very swing-happy counts because a, a hitter feels re relatively comfortable in 2-2 or 3-2 that they're going to get a fastball. They also feel relatively comfortable that they've seen a bunch of pitches, so they've probably seen at least one of your off-speed pitches, so they know what stuff looks like at this point. They're also comfortable with how hard you throw, your mechanics, all this stuff, because the bat's, again, pretty deep at that point. You know, 2-2 could also have a couple foul balls, so this could be a 6-pitch six, six pitch at bat um, on that first 2-2 two, two count or 7-pitch at bat on that first 2-2 two, two count. Well, not on the first 2-2 two, two count, but... Um, so basically, the, the goal here is... If you say, yeah, the way I've set this hitter up or the way the bat's gone, I think I should throw a 2-2 slider. Okay, great. So if, if your rationale is because of everything that's happened, we're going to throw a 2-2 slider and you miss, the question is, what's changed? Has anything really changed? Um, you know, it, it depends. So he could 
yank that ball foul, right? Pull it down the line. Now that's still a 2-2 count. So say you throw that slider again and it's a ball, you know, uh, is it 3-2 what you're going to throw again? Maybe, maybe not. But in general, if we just say we've gotten just a 2-2, then you throw a ball, then we go to 3-2. The 2-2 pitch, your read on it is is not going to change that much if you miss. And the and the real big test here, I think, this is the I think the most important part of it, is hitters essentially always guess fastball in 3-2. They always essentially know that a fastball is coming 3-2. And they're geared up and ready for it. That's why there's tons of swings on 3-2. There's tons of foul balls on 3-2 as well. Hitters often will swing at fastballs out of the zone on 3-2 a little bit as well. So when you throw something 2-2 that's not a fastball, especially a changeup, a curveball, or slider, if you miss, you're just giving the hitter more confidence that the fastball is coming. It's, oh, he tried to trick me with a 2-2 slider, and he missed. So here comes the fastball. And that's where you really get hurt, unfortunately, where if you do want to throw a breaking ball and uh, and you decide 2-2 is the good time to do it, basically what you need to tell yourself is, all right, I've got two chances to make this pitch. You know, I've got two chances to throw this two, this curveball over the plate or the slider over the plate or this changeup over the plate. And basically, if I'm not, not good enough to do that, then, oh, well, then he beat me. But that's, I think, the most important factor is that if you throw them that 2-2 changeup, curveball, slider, whatever, and you miss, the hitter is very much ready for a fastball now in 3-2, more so than otherwise. More so than if you'd thrown him you know, a, a slider early and then three fastballs in a row. Now you're 2-2, you throw him another fastball. He might have a little more inkling that he could get something other than a fastball because he's only seen, he hasn't seen a, a breaking ball in a while. But when you throw a 2-2 and you miss... They're going to be like, okay, he tried. Here comes the fastball. And if they're right, if you don't have the guts to throw it again, and now you switch to the fastball 3-2, they're probably going to be as 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 ready as they could possibly be for your fastball in any situation because they've seen tons of pitches. They're guessing correctly. They're guessing that you were kind of a coward, that you threw that slider and you missed, and now you don't want to throw it again because you're afraid to walk him. And it's really just a bad situation. So... I think that's the the long and the short of it but i generally agree obviously there's never anything set in stone but as a general rule that pitchers are trying to pave out their bat when they say okay two two curveball all right i'm gonna throw this pitch but i know if i miss i'm gonna come right back with it because i think it's the right pitch now and if i throw for a ball it's still gonna be the right pitch and i'm not gonna just gonna give in to him so that's i think the overview of two two and three two counts All right, now's time for our listener Q&A portion of the show. If you have a question you'd like answered on the show, please email a voice recording to hello at danblewitt.com. All right, lastly, on our Q&A section, I got an email this week asking about an article that I wrote, which was, um, it was titled, What Playing Through Pain Taught Me About Excuses and Leadership. And uh, in this in this email, he just asked me, hey, you know, I've had some shoulder problems and at times I'm only like 75% and uh, I, I'm i not sure if I should play or if I should sit on the bench. I don't want to be hurting my team. I also don't want to be, you know, weak and making excuses. So, you know, what should I do? And uh, this is a tough question. Um, essentially, what I wrote in that article, which I'd suggest you go on my website, it's danblue.com backslash the dash journey is my new blog on a little more of like the real world side of uh, being a baseball parent and as an athlete in general. And in this article, I basically explain that if you suit up to play, and this was coming from my experiences in pro ball, so it's different at different levels, but essentially if you if you tell your manager that you can play, they expect you to play at 100%. So even if your ankle's a little messed up, or even if your shoulder's a little banged up, if you're in the lineup, you have to be you're going to be graded and judged as if you're hundred percent. Everyone's going to expect you to run full speed after every ball. They're going to expect you to pitch the same as you otherwise would, even if you're not truly hundred percent, you don't get any, you don't get any points deducted and you don't get any leeway for being 92% because your knee really does hurt, but you're going to suck it up and play. So if you do decide to suck it up and play, you can't use it as an excuse. That's essentially the rule. Um, the guys that do do this stuff where they go out there a little bit hurt and then they, when they don't play well, they go, oh yeah, my knee was hurting. Uh, yeah, I know I, my ankles really bugging me, man. It's like, nah, we don't care. 
If you said you could play, then you're expected to play as if you're hundred percent. And if you truly can't play at hundred percent, then you need to tell the manager that you can't. And that's the time to go on the DL or whatever, get a couple of days off. So the question of when you hit that point is what this email was asking. And that, and that point is really when I genuinely can't do the stuff that I normally do. And that's ambiguous, I realize, but it's essentially the right answer that if you can't go out, like for me, I threw, you know, 90 to 94. If I'm my arms to the point where I'm going to go out there throwing 87 to 90, I probably need to be on the disabled list. If you're an outfielder and you really can't get to a ball in the gap that you normally catch nine out of 10 times because your ankles are so swollen, you need to be in the disabled list. Um, if you're, you know, uh, another example for a position player, if you're going to hit a ground ball, you know, a double play ball, and you can't run full speed down the line to break it up, you probably need to be out of the lineup. So those are the situations where you really can't do the normal things that you're capable of doing, where it becomes very uncertain of whether you can actually get people out or actually get hits or actually contribute at least the average expected play that everyone expects from you. So again, that's like, if I can flag down this ball in the gap typically, and now I just can't, then we need to get someone in there that can, because they always have someone ready to do that. Now there's exceptions. Like if you're, you know, a superstar, sometimes your 80% is just better than everyone else's 95%. That doesn't apply to almost everybody. It applies to well, it applies to almost nobody. So sure, if you're Mike Trout, they might keep you in the lineup, even though you might have to jog down the line because they know you're going to hit a couple balls out or you're going to hit a couple doubles into the gap or you can just trot into second base anyway. And you're still probably going to provide more value than maybe a replacement level player that they'd have to sub in for you. Like they're not going to have another superstar on the bench. Right. So I think that's, um, in a sense, in a nutshell, what this is about. So for young players, they should be telling their coaches when they have pain because we're trying to protect them and their, and their career and give them and give them longevity. Uh, but when you get to a certain point, whether it's high school baseball or college baseball, definitely pro baseball, you're going to have aches and pains and ups and downs. They're just always going to be there. And if you're one of those guys who can't be in the lineup when he's not a hundred percent, then you're not going to last in pro ball. Those guys get noticed very quickly. Um, and it's a very big negative. Everyone knows who you are when you go five innings and you just dive out of the game. Oh, my shoulder's starting to feel bad. I, I got to come out coach. Everyone knows who you are and it's not a respect. It's just very, you don't have much respect and, uh, everyone, again, we know who you are. So there's a a certain amount of toughness, but it just hits a point where when you actually can't do the job, the way it's expected to be done, that's when you have to pull the plug and say, Hey coach, I think I need a couple days off or I need to get some treatment or I need to go see the doctor or I need to go on the disabled list. Well, that's it for today's episode of dear baseball gods. If you enjoy the show and would like to support me while improving your baseball IQ, buy one of my books or enroll today in an online pitching course. Sign up for any of my courses through the links in the show notes and save 20% with code BASEBALLGODS just for being a listener. My online courses walk you through pitching mechanics, strategy, learning new pitches, and mental skills training. They're start to finish an amazing solution for pitchers, parents, and coaches who want step-by-step instruction. Pitching Isn't Complicated, my first book, is a thorough pitching manual with strategy, pitch grips, mechanics, mindset, routines, and other high-level pitching concepts. Not sure what your son is in for if he falls in love with the game? Dear Baseball Gods, the book is my memoir, a story of growing up in the game, persevering through injuries and setbacks, and struggling with identity when I finally had to clean out my locker. Buy a copy today via the links in the show notes, available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook if you just can't get enough of my voice. Be sure to subscribe to my weekly email list where you'll get updates on all my new videos and episodes. Nearly 4,000 people get my emails, and you should too. Sign up through the link in the show notes. Lastly, who do you know who can use some good advice? Please share this podcast with a friend, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and subscribe to my YouTube channel where you'll find this podcast and hundreds of baseball instructional videos. As always, hustle and stay pious. I'm Dan Blewett, and I'll see you next time.